Nuclear Hot Seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. The Corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat. It's the bomb. <laughs> Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, our interview is with Susan Corbett. She is chair of the National Sierra Club Nuclear Issues Activist Team, the National Sierra Club team that watchdogs nuclear issues. She talks about waste problems, radiation, and the difficulties associated with living in South Carolina, which is the most nuclear industry intensive state in our country. Learn from Susan about the battle to prevent South Carolina from becoming, in her words, the nuclear waste paid toilet of the South. That interview, plus numbnuts of the week, our radiation health and awareness tip, and Radcast Radiation Weather Report, all coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 14, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting with the U.S., where there has been big news coming out of Capitol Hill. Senator Barbara Boxer from California is threatening to sue the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission for withholding information related to the now-defunct nuclear power plant at San Onofre that lawmakers and watchdog groups feared was a security risk. During a hearing held last Thursday, January 30th, Boxer addressed NRC Chair Allison McFarlane and the four other presidentially appointed commissioners by saying, maybe we have to go to court. Maybe we have to sue you. I will get this information even if I have to go to whistleblowers. hoo Boxer lives up to her name. She chastised the commissioners, saying NRC officials had said very sweetly that they would provide all the information she requested and then presented a phony legal argument, claiming they were not required to do so. Boxer, who chairs the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, otherwise known as 800-pound gorilla, said, We do not yet have all the answers to how that disastrous situation at the San Onofre plant occurred. She said it was unclear why NRC officials permitted the flawed equipment to be installed in the first place, and that the information she was seeking will provide lessons learned for the Commission's future safety decision-making activities. Makes me proud, I say proud, to be a Californian. More good news out of Capitol Hill? Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont may introduce legislation to repeal the Price-Anderson Act, which protects nuclear utilities from having to pay the potential full cost of damages in the event of a reactor accident. Under Price-Anderson, as it currently exists, the nuclear industry as a whole would be liable for only 12 to $15 billion in damages. Each individual utility would be liable for only a fraction of that. If damages exceeded that amount, well, probably Congress would force taxpayers to make up the difference. Consider that both Fukushima and Chernobyl accidents have caused damages in the $300 billion range, and Fukushima is still happening, so we don't know when or where that number will end. No utility would operate nuclear reactors without the Price-Anderson protection unless it was sure its reactors were fail-safe. Ha! Sanders challenged conservative senators to join him in his effort. And an update on the USS Ronald Reagan case. Congress has instructed the Defense Department to launch an inquiry into potential health impacts on Navy first responders from Japan's March 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Defense Department officials said that they were taking the request seriously. According to information published in Stars and Stripes and confirmed by what Nuclear Hot Seat has received privately, 
Some of the sailors claimed that they were pressured into signing forms confirming that they had been given iodine pills when none had been provided. They were made to sign these forms before they were allowed to leave the USS Ronald Reagan. According to attorney Paul C. Garner, who is representing military personnel who served in Operation Tomodachi in their lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company, we had 51 victims of record and we expect double that figure because we've been contacted by probably 250 victims. There's a latency period, meaning after exposure to radiation, but we have filed on behalf of all who participated in Operation Tomodachi to preserve their rights so that they can file a claim in the future when something arises. The lawsuit claims that the Japanese government, which owns the utility, TEPCO, lied about the amount of radiation leaking from the Fukushima Daiichi plant, putting the Reagan sailors at risk. The suit is being refiled in federal court in San Diego this Thursday, January 6th, and Nuclear Hot Seat has been promised an interview with one of the attorneys, Charles Bonner, who's previously been interviewed on this show, to be on next Tuesday's program. Local West Coast governments are making their needs known as well. The Mendocino County Board of Supervisors in Northern California approved a letter to President Obama calling for international assistance to address the continuing Fukushima disaster. Marin County officials just north of San Francisco have asked for monitoring of the Fukushima plume because of concerns for environment and food supply. The city of Berkeley unanimously passed a Fukushima resolution, and the city of Fairfax, California, passed a resolution saying urgent international rescue was needed at the site because it poses health and safety concerns to America's West Coast. According to Bloomberg News, the runoff from the Japanese plant will mingle with radiation released by other atomic stations such as Diablo Canyon in California. In 2012, the most recent year for which we have information, the Diablo Canyon nuclear facility in San Luis Obispo discharged 870 tons a day of water that was contaminated with radioactive tritium to the tune of about 136 trillion becquerels. The plant also discharged cesium-137 and strontium-90, and all of this is based on data from its operator, Pacific Gas and Electric. That's more tritium than has been released at Fukushima, but as PG&E spokesmodel Blair Jones pointed out, tritium is produced when a reactor is operating. Fukushima is not operating, so naturally the tritium levels are lower. Splitting hairs on the deck of the Titanic. For a common sense interpretation of all of this, look to the Midwest, where Dr. Maureen McHugh is a founding member and former director of the University of Iowa Global Health Studies Program. She says, the mainstream media has not covered the phenomenon. We're talking about radiation in the water and what's happening on the West Coast. She went on, I think we also experience regulatory capture in this country. I don't know how much of the contamination is approaching the West Coast. It makes sense when you look at ocean currents and wind streams and the movement of marine life that it will eventually reach the West Coast. In what concentrations? What amounts? Nobody actually knows. It's predicted that, in fact, it may concentrate as much on the West Coast as anywhere in Fukushima as it keeps coming wave after wave. Well, you know the anti-nuclear agenda is heating up in public because show business has now started picking up on the story. Peter Coyote, the actor most famous for his role as E.T.'s sympathetic scientist, questioned nuclear energy advocate and environmental Benedict Arnold Stuart Brand, who's still dicking around with Pandora's promised box, was asked by Coyote, what I find disturbing and sort of a little sociopathic about your perspective is the absence of doubt. You are willing to risk the entire commons by introducing a biocide that's fatal to everything with replicating cells. That stays deadly longer than all human history. In light of such a risk, which will be enduring forever, why are you not willing to entertain all the prior precautionary steps 
rather than continuing the model of centralized power, centralized sale, and keeping us consumers at the risk of the entire biosphere. Nobody cared what Brand had to say because the audience was too busy applauding. And now comes word that legendary musician David Crosby has been tweeting about the issue. In December, he said, what Christmas present do I want? America gets the hell out of the Middle East, and someone besides TEPCO fixes Fukushima. Last week, Crosby retweeted a link to ENE News. In January, he tweeted, by the way, that radioactive lava is still bubbling under Fukushima, and TEPCO still has no answer but to cool it by pouring seawater. Then in an interview in the Illinois Entertainer from February 3rd, he said, Am I upset about Fukushima poisoning the Pacific Ocean? Yeah. Am I upset about TEPCO and the Japanese government lying through their teeth? Yeah. I can just hear the update of Judy Blue Eyes. Fukushima sucks. TEPCO can't handle it. Poisoning the seas. Where will it end? Radiation kills. Poor seals and polar bears. Fukushima sucks. Abe's a dick. Over to Japan, where a 20-year veteran radio show commentator quit his job at Japan Broadcasting Corporation, NHK, after the public broadcaster told him to drop the subject of nuclear power during the Tokyo gubernatorial election. That's the same as the mayoral election. Toro Nakakita, a professor of economics at Toyo University, had been in charge of the Business Outlook segment of Radio Asa Ikiban show, aired weekdays on NHK Radio Daiichi. Nakakita said his original manuscript for the January 30th program pointed out the increase in costs for the resumption of nuclear reactor operations, saying, damages to be paid in the wake of a nuclear plant accident are extraordinarily high. Really controversial stuff there. However, when he showed the manuscript to a program director on the day before the scheduled broadcast, Nakakita was asked to change the theme. He said that NHK told him not to talk about, quote, nuclear issues during the Tokyo gubernatorial election campaign period. The election is scheduled for February 9th. Nakakita said, we should have substantial debates precisely because it is the campaign period. NHK reacted with excessive voluntary restraint. Last week, Peter Barakan, a freelance radio show host, revealed in his morning music and news program on InterFM that he had been pressured by, quote, two broadcasting stations not to touch on nuclear power issues until after February 9th. He did not identify the stations, but works for NHK FM Radio and NHK World, as well as other private TV and radio stations. A thorough write-up on the problems by the Abe government-approved NHK is in the International New York Times, written by Martin Fackler, dateline February 2nd, and we will have a link to this up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode 137. Meanwhile, in that Tokyo Metropolitan Governor election race, Candidate Hosokawa Morihiro, who just happens to be a former prime minister of Japan, said that he has access to a Russian top-secret document that reveals evidence of radiation from Fukushima killing polar bears and other animals in the Arctic Ocean. No wonder Abe Bebe's NHK doesn't want their people talking about nuclear issues. This next story is numbnuts adjacent. Juan Carlos Lentijo, who's head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA's mission to Fukushima, floated, yuck, 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 the idea of releasing radioactive water into the ocean. Lentijo added that TEPCO should weigh the possible damaging effects of discharging toxic water against the total risks involved in the overall decommissioning work process. Shunichi Tanaka, chairman of Japan's pro-nuclear nuclear regulation authority, said, You cannot keep storing water forever. We have to make a choice comparing all risks involved. Kyoto News reports that the groundwater will be pumped out before it mingles with the highly radioactive water accumulating and leaking from the cracked basements of the flooded reactor buildings. 
but that the filtration systems are unable to keep pace and storage space is rapidly running out. So dumping appears to be the government's only solution. That's right, you want to get rid of the leaks? Just dump all of it. Then nothing will leak because it'll all be gone. But of course, Japan and TEPCO are going to build a giant experimental freezer around the complex, which is expected by them to take two years. That's nuclear years, meaning a decade or longer with at least a thousand cost overruns. And even as all the systems are implemented, it's only going to reduce the daily flow of contaminated water by about 25%. To grant the Liar Liar Pants on Fire Award, we turn again to the IAEA. Their team, which visited the Fukushima evacuation area last October, said that decontamination was proceeding well and that engagement with people affected by the accident was good. That statement was completely contradicted by an interview in Nuclear Hot Seat number 135 just two weeks ago when we learned of the plight of Fukushima nuclear refugee Setsuko Kida, as reported by Beverly Finlay Kaneko. The IAEA team of professional liars recommended much greater use of personal dosimeters to get accurate meanings to support planning for resettlement and also to reassure people in the wider prefecture, particularly parents of small children. I suggest you listen to Nuclear Hot Seat number 135 to find out exactly how heinous these people are with their lies. Around 1,400 people have filed a lawsuit jointly against the three manufacturers of the reactors in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The lawsuit is seeking compensation of only 100 yen, meaning one U.S. dollar each, in damages caused by the 2011 meltdown and ongoing nuclear disaster. The lawsuit is aimed at raising awareness of the problem that continues at Fukushima Daiichi. About 1,000 of the plaintiffs are Japanese nationals, and another 400 people come from countries all over the world. They are suing Toshiba, GE, and Hitachi for failing to complete necessary adjustments to the safety of the reactors, which have been in use since 1971. Lest we forget the sword of Damocles hanging over all of us here on the planet, TEPCO is still engaged in the process of removing fuel rods from spent fuel pool 4. And now cracks have been found during an inspection on a fuel assembly. Nuclear engineer Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.com told us this was going to start showing up. And here it is. But that's not all. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. None that's out of week. First were the comic books, telling the kids of Fukushima that you will probably die of cancer. But now they've topped it, because there is going to be a kids cancer seminar in Fukushima. A special extracurricular event so that you can learn more. It's aimed at 5th and 6th graders. And the subtitle on the poster says, Especially because this is Fukushima, we need the best cancer education in Japan. Well, aren't they just a caring bunch? Supporters include Fukushima Prefecture, Fukushima Prefecture Board of Education, the City of Fukushima, Fukushima City Teachers Association, Fukushima Prefectural Medical University, and Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, disaster capitalism is alive and well. On the schedule, they're going to have an orientation, a lecture about cancer, and a hospital visit, so they'll know what's in their future. Then, in the afternoon, they'll have a hands-on seminar. No word as to what their hands are going to be on. There will be an ultrasound experience, like they haven't had that already, and, curiously, a surgery experience. I don't even want to think about what that might be. Kids, extra credit if you volunteer to be our thyroid surgery model. This is truly none that's out of week. For those of you who want to catch up on everything that's going wrong at Fukushima, Harvey Wasserman wrote a great article 
50 Reasons We Should Fear the Worst from Fukushima. We're going to have it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode number 137. Catching up with the rest of the world, Ukraine is on the brink of civil war. The Ukrainian Security Service has reported anonymous threats to blow up nuclear power plants. Specifically targeted are reactors in the western Revno region. While this has been called near-nuclear blackmail, what do you mean near? The Ministry of Energy has placed all energy facilities on high alert. Even if you don't like the government, guys, don't go all Chernobyl on us. No, no, uh-uh, yet, yet. The United Kingdom's largest nuclear plant ordered thousands of workers to stay at home on Friday, January 31st, after recording increased levels of radioactivity. The Sellafield Nuclear Reprocessing Site in Cumbria, northwest England, told all non-essential employees not to come to work after the elevated readings were picked up by a monitor at the north end of the site. The facility is about 300 miles northwest of London. No word as to what caused the elevated readings. South Korea has given a green light to a $7 billion project. That's the price right now, guys. It's going to go up to build two nuclear reactors by 2020. Whew. World record time for nukes. It is the first approval in South Korea since a safety scandal that led to the shutdown of several working nuclear reactors over fake documents. This took place in 2013. Checking the documents a little more closely this time, guys. Construction on Vietnam's first nuclear power plant at Phuoc Dinh in the southern Ninh Thuan province will not commence later this year as previously planned. Instead, first concrete is not expected to be poured until 2017 or 2018. And remember, these are nuke years, which are like dog years, only more expensive. And who knows if they'll even pour the concrete, because a lot can happen between now and then. Good news out of Canada, where officials are preparing to introduce new legislation that would increase the liability for civilian damages for nuclear operators from $75 million to $1 billion. The new proposal would establish a claims tribunal to speed up damage claims in the wake of a potential nuclear accident, expand the range of damages that can be claimed, and would lengthen the amount of time a person could make a claim for latent illnesses from 10 years to 30 years. While you're at it, Canada, why don't you just shut the things down? And while you're at it, don't build that nuclear waste dump in northern Saskatchewan, or we're going to sick Marius Paul and Candace Paul and everybody else up there on you. And finally, in India, the People's Movement Against Nuclear Energy has embarked upon an indefinite hunger strike, which started on January 31st, which was the 900th day of their struggle. They have five specific demands, including abandon the Kudankulam nuclear power plant altogether, meaning Units 3 and 4 projects, and order an independent and impartial scientific inquiry into the Kudankulam 1 and 2 projects. An indefinite hunger strike is like tag team fasting where people come in, give their energy for the time they can, and then go to be replaced by others, maintaining a continual fasting presence in the hunger strike against nuclear. Okay, here's the weekly pitch. Listen up, because I've got bandwidth charges. This is my reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your donations to keep going, growing, and improving. If you like what you hear, and you'd like to hear more, Help me keep this thing going. On the homepage, NuclearHotSeat.com, there is a great big red donate button. You really can't miss it. If you do, just scroll down slightly, you will find it. Please use it. Whatever you can do to help, I'm truly grateful. Okay, time for today's interview, and I just loved talking with this woman. Susan Corbett is chair of the National Sierra Club Nuclear Issues Activist Team that watchdogs nuclear issues. She's also the chair of the South Carolina chapter of the Sierra Club, which has more than 5,200 members. She has a wicked sense of humor, as well as a great southern accent, and she very graciously joined us from her sickbed 
near Columbia, South Carolina. Susan Corbett, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for inviting me. Give us a picture first of how you came to your involvement in anti-nuclear issues and how long you've been involved. Well, it started in the uh, late 70s. I moved into this area of where I am now in Columbia, South Carolina in 76. And I found out they were building a nuclear power plant about 10 miles from where I was living. I was living in this beautiful place in the country. And, of course, I didn't know a whole lot about it at that time. But what I did know about it, I didn't like the idea. So I got involved in fighting that construction and the operating a license for that nuclear power plant. And that's how I first got involved in the whole issue of nuclear power. It goes back, you know, 35 years now. What was that site and how successful were you? Well, it's the VC Summer Nuclear Site owned by Scana Corporation here right outside of Columbia. And, of course, we were not successful because the NRC has never denied an operating license. They never saw a license application that they didn't love, so um, I don't think that they've ever denied one. So we were not successful in defeating the construction of that plant, unfortunately, and it has been operating ever since. You now have a position with the Sierra Club, and you have quite a bit of responsibility with them. Give us a sense as to the work you do, and then we'll move into the individual sites and what's going on. Well, I was involved in the anti-nuclear movement for many decades before I ever joined the Sierra Club. I was In the 70s and 80s, there were these alliances. You probably heard of the Clamshell Alliance, and we had the Palmetto Alliance in South Carolina, so I was involved with the alliances for that decade, and uh, I didn't come to the Sierra Club until much, much later, really until the late 90s, because they were trying to bring the plutonium here from Rocky Flats, and I tried to start up my own organization, and it's just really hard. And the Sierra Club was meeting at the church where I was a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Columbia, and I started going to their meetings, and then I read their conservation position, and they, they have been opposed to nuclear stuff going way back into the uh, 70s. So they had all this really good jargon on their on their website, of, and but they just weren't, you know, doing any work around the issue. And I just said, well, golly, you know, they believe the same thing I do, so I'm going to join the Sierra Club and I'm going to work on all issues, but particularly on the nuclear issue, uh, since it is there on their conservation pages that they don't like it. So, so I got involved really in the late 90s with the Sierra Club. I joined in 98. I became leader of the local group a couple of years later, and now I am the state chair, and I've been the state chair for six years. I keep, 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 keep getting reelected. I they won't let me they won't let me go away. It's just a volunteer position. And so the South Carolina chapter of the Sierra Club has become one of the most vocal and outspoken critics of all things nuclear within the whole National Sierra Club. And certainly within the state of South Carolina, we are the only environmental group willing to speak out against nuclear power. All the other groups kind of, you know, fall in there with groups like the Nature Conservancy who just kind of are kind of agnostic about it and don't speak about it very much. So we are the only ones that have been willing to really go hard line and, and fight it head on. Give us the big picture. What nuclear sites are there in South Carolina that are causing concern? South Carolina has seven operating reactors. We have an, a very early alliance in, with the nuclear, all things nuclear, because the Savannah River site is here. The Savannah River site was developed in the 50s by DuPont Corporation as a partnership with the Department of Defense and Department of Energy to build nuclear bombs. So basically, it was one of the main sites, along with Hanford, Washington, that produced the materials, the, the plutonium and, and the triggers and all the things that were necessary to, uh, to make nuclear bombs. In fact, around here, it was called a bomb plant. So early on, South Carolinians were taught that nuclear was good because it, for many years, uh, and it may still be, the largest employer in the state. Uh, and it was huge. It's a 312 square mile uh, area of the, of the of the state down on the Savannah River. It borders Georgia. It gets billions of dollars of taxpayer money from the Department of Energy. It employs thousands of people. So uh, we had this early indoctrination with all things nuclear. So it was it was not hard to go when the when the Adams for Peace programs were being pushed that you know nuclear could be used for peaceful purposes that, uh, you know, our legislators and our officials bought into that. And so we have seven operating reactors in our state. We had an early uh, experimental reactor, the PAR reactor, that has been decommissioned. 
So we, we are one of the most heavily nuclearized states. I believe nuclear provides 55% of our electricity. So along with the uh, seven operating reactors and the Savannah River site, which, by the way, has, I forget how many millions of gallons of high-level radioactive waste that was produced during the Cold War that has still not been successfully dispositioned. Is that in tanks like the Hanford site, how it's the tanks are leaking? It's, it's, yes, it is. It is, exactly. Now, some of the, the tanks are a little bit different than the Hanford tanks, but they aren't particularly any much better, and, and they are certainly going to disintegrate and leak, and there's a race on to get the stuff out of there. But unfortunately, the funding keeps getting cut because nobody sees the importance of that. There's a race against time because that stuff is not getting any safer and the tanks are getting thinner and weaker and more likely to leak. So it's just very much like Hanford there. And there's other stuff too. There's plutonium there. There's all kinds of stuff there. So it's a really nasty place. So we, in terms of carries of radiation, we probably have the largest inventory in the whole United States at Savannah River site. Aside from that, from that and the seven reactors, we also have a Westinghouse fuel fabrication plant where I was arrested many years ago, where they actually bring the uh, materials here and fabricate the fuel rods that go into the commercial reactors. So we have that, and then we ha and we had for a long time, well, we still have a nuclear laundry where they actually launder nuclear materials, clothes and things that they want to reuse. And we have the Barnwell low-level nuclear waste site, which is the thing that we're getting ready to, to go into court about. It's a, uh, a site down near the Savannah River site where the low-level waste is being brought. And it's not a part of the Department of Energy. It's a private commercial uh, operation run by a company for profit where nuclear waste, what's considered low-level, which we'll talk about that in a minute if you want to, is brought and disposed of. So we have lots of these nuclear facilities scattered all over the state. There was a story we covered on Nuclear Hot Seat on January 9th that the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control confirmed that a plume of radioactive tritium was not only in the groundwater around the Barnwell nuclear site, but that it was also migrating and moving southwest towards the Savannah River site. Yes, and it has been doing that for a long time. They have had trouble. Let me go back a little bit. Every low-level, well, every nuclear waste site in this country has leaked. They have never been successfully able to contain this stuff. And particularly at the low-level waste sites, there were, originally there were six or seven of them. There was one at Sheffield, Illinois. There was one at uh, Maxi Flats, Kentucky. There was one in Beatty, Nevada. There was a whole bunch of them. And they all closed in the late 70s, and they were all leaking when they closed. And they're still leaking. And Barnwell stayed open for whatever reason. Uh, they kept it open, and we've been fighting it ever since. Uh, but this tritium started migrating off the site fairly quickly. When you say fairly <laughs> quickly, how far back does that go? They were having problems with it, you know, over a decade ago. It started opening. It started, you know, it opened in the 70s. So within 20 years of operating, it started leaking out into the environment. It wasn't long. And, you know, originally all these places, they produced, they predicted it would be hundreds of years before any of these materials moved off site. Well, they were completely wrong in every single case. In every single case, the materials have leaked and gotten into the groundwater. And what's particularly onerous about the Barnwell site is that this is a very wet area. This is old coastal plain. The water table is just down there, you know, 10 feet below the surface. Here, where I even live further up in the upstate, and I could dig a hole in my backyard and the water will come up. It's just too easy to get into the groundwater down here in the south. It's not like it is in, like, out west where, you know, you're half a mile down or whatever. So it's particularly troublesome that they would consider using this kind of shallow land burial. And also very disturbing at the Savannah River site, too, that you have this shallow groundwater is right underneath and also this huge aquifer, the Tuscaloosa Aquifer, which is the largest southern aquifer, goes all the way over to Atlanta. It's also down there under all of that. So, yes, this stuff has been leaking for a long time. It's one of the reasons that we kept dogging this and kept challenging the license because they have to be re-licensed every so often. You know, they can't just operate indefinitely. So every time they, go, they would go to a like, reapply for a license, we would try to challenge them. This last time, it's gotten dragged out for almost a decade now. The administrative law court kept sending it back, and we kept challenging it. And finally, it's gotten sent to the state Supreme Court. So that's where we will be on Wednesday at the South Carolina Supreme Court to see if the Supreme Court sanctions the idea that, and it's even more now than when we first took this 
it's very apparent that this stuff is migrating off site. What would be the recourse? What would be the best possible outcome to come from this hearing you're going to be going to on Wednesday? Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, I don't know if they've changed their practices any. I mean, obviously some of the technology has gotten better, but they still use these concrete vaults with the, that they that they put the stuff in. It has holes in the in the bottom and in the top because they don't isolate it from the water. They can't. It's some reason they want the water to pass through there. To um, keep it cool, th probably. I guess so. But you know, so it's there's always going to be uh, water. It's coming in contact with water. So I don't know that there's any solution as far as the plume. I mean, I guess you could dig down and create a uh, what they call an engineered barrier, but I don't know how how far down it is. I I, I don't know the technical aspects of it. If they would. You know, they've done this in some places. They dig down, they create this engineered barrier. But I, I don't know. There's no good answer. The, the answer is to stop burying it this way and go to a what we had called four years ago. We called for above-ground disposal where you actually build buildings and you put these vaults in the buildings where you can see them if they start to leak and they can be repackaged. You don't bury it in the ground where then if it starts to leak, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's leaking, but we don't know where it's leaking, and we don't know how, how much is leaking, because there's no liners in any of these trenches. There's no collection, no leachate collection system. It's just in the ground. It's like we call it the kitty litter, you know. <laughs> Dig a hole, put it in there, cover it up, and no well, you know. A <laughs> um, little bit more lethal than kitty litter, no matter how one feels about that. <laughs> Well, and you know, the other thing about low-level waste, it's really a misnomer, Libby, because it's not really low-level. What it is is just low concentrations. But every nasty, toxic, carcinogenic radionuclide that's been created by mankind is, is in there. I used to go and check the manifests that would come in in the shipments to see how many uh, grams of plutonium were in there in each shipment and how many grams of americium and neptunium and californium and all these exotic heavy uh, radioactive particles that we created and we split the atom and they're all there. They're all buried just in the ground in concrete vaults 10 feet above the water table. So if the South Carolina Supreme Court on this Wednesday decides against the operating company because of their practices does it take their license away? How does this impact them in any substantive way? Well, I doubt if they're going to take their license. What they might do is require them to take some further steps to ensure that more tritium does not continue to leak out, whether that be through liners in the trenches or – I'm not sure exactly. That's a good question. I don't know what recourse they have at this point. They've been doing it for so long. There's so much already buried there. You know, you can't dig that stuff up at this point. A lot of it is so radioactive that it has to be put in the ground remotely. It has to be uh, handled by a person on a crane behind a wall with a, a crane that picks it up and puts it in there. So not like you can just go out there with a bunch of guys in, in suits and dig this stuff up. I guess the challenge would be is that they stop doing it the way they're doing it and find some way to handle this material. I, I hate to use the word disposed because it really isn't disposed of. Where can they bring it? Where what? There's no place to put it. Well, what they need to do, like I said, well, number one, they need to quit making it. That's, that's the first thing we need to stop doing. What they need to do is quit making this stuff. But, you know, some of it is medical waste, I will say, that, and there are some uses for medical isotopes. I had a, a nuclear scan a couple of years ago that I hated to do, but my doctor said I really needed it. So there are medical uses, that we, and we do have to deal with the waste from that. But that's a very, very small percentage of the amount of nuclear waste that we have to deal with. And again, the way that we recommend it is that you build above-ground buildings, you know, big buildings, and you put these concrete vaults inside the building, and you monitor them. It's called monitored retrievable storage. And that way, if a canister starts to leak, you know, you can go and get it and take it and, and repackage it uh, and put it back in there. So that, And then after a certain amount of time, once the materials have decayed, to the point where they're not dangerous anymore, you can free that space up for another canister in there or something like that. So we had long advocated that the above ground monitored retrievable storage was a much safer way than digging a hole in the ground and dumping it in there and hoping nothing happens to it, You're hoping the groundwater doesn't come up. I mean, what's interesting about this is that the groundwater has actually come up into the trenches on several occasions. 
Mm. So it, you know, it, it's it's just a bad it's a it's a bad place to be burying nuclear waste. They they should stop doing it. Has there been any kind of medical study or health study done in the surrounding areas, or is there even any colloquial information about cancer clusters? I don't think anyone really knows what the long-term health, health effects of radiation getting in the environment are. Uh, one of the things that happened that was very interesting is that about 15 years ago, we were complaining about the fact that they dug these long trenches, they would put these canisters in there, and they don't cover up the trench until the whole thing is full, which might take them six months or a year. So in the meantime, rain is collecting in the trench that is in contact with the waste, and the rain water collects, and it's full of tritium. So they were pumping the rainwater out into these holding ponds because it had tritium in it. Well, the ponds leaked and got onto the grounds of an African-American church that was adjacent oh. to the property and contaminated the soil. So they had to go and dig up the soil around the church and cart it away. But who knows? I mean, the, the insidious thing about radiation is that it doesn't really leave a smoking gun. People are transitory, they move in, they move out, they don't stay, and there hasn't been, in my opinion, good cancer data done in this state. There's, there's a cancer registry, but I've checked it over the years, and um, there have been some things that have been interesting anomalies. One time I had a, a map that showed that every county where there was a nuclear facility in this state had a higher than average leukemia rate. I still have that map. That was one year, that was probably maybe in 2002, something like that. But there's not good data about it, that's for sure. The area down there is rather remote. It's very rural, sparsely populated. And what's happening is the Mary's Branch Creek that this is emptying into flows down into the Savannah River eventually. So all the water that's bubbling up and going through the Barnwell site and, and trickling into the Mary's Branch Creek is going out into the Savannah River eventually, which goes down and is the drinking water for Hilton Head, where a lot of rich people live, and for the city of Savannah, if I remember correctly. And there have been some studies that show that there is uh, tritium. You can see tritium in drinking water. Now, of course, the argument is that it's, you know, dilution is the solution to pollution, right? That's what they say, and they just think they're so cute when they say it. I've heard them say it. So, you know, their answer is it's below harmful levels. But again, the insidious thing about radiation is who knows what level is dangerous to what person. And also, exposure to radiation is cumulative. So the more you're exposed to, the more radiation you're exposed to, the more chances are your body is being compromised. So you get a little bit in your water, and you get a little bit in the fish that you're eating from Fukushima, you get a little bit in the atmosphere from the bomb testing, and it all accumulates, it bioaccumulates into the whole biosphere and in our bodies. And who knows where the, your body's threshold is and when the limit has been reached and it just can't stand up anymore to the uh, effects of radiation and you develop a cancer. It's, just, it's a very unspecific sort of uh, science in terms of determining that. It's not like mesothelioma where you know that you got that from being exposed to asbestos It's not, or lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. It's not quite as direct a link that you can prove. And that's what they're counting on. And that's what I hear a lot of times from the industry is that radiation really isn't that dangerous and hasn't killed, nobody's died and this, that, and the other and all that stuff. So it's a very shadowy thing to chase, the health effects. It's very difficult. Although we, all, we know that every study has shown that radiation is dangerous. What strategies have you found to be most effective in fighting against the nuclear industry in South Carolina? Well, nobody likes to be dumped on. And this is a big thing going on in South Carolina right now because we have become like the garbage dump of the South for a lot of different things. We, right now we're fighting a big fight with big garbage, municipal garbage, because these big waste management companies from other states have found that our dumping fees are much cheaper than, say, Pennsylvania or Virginia or New York. So they load all the garbage from the northern states onto trains and bring them down here and dump it in South Carolina in our landfills. So the whole states onto trains and bring them down here and dump it in South Carolina in our landfills. So the whole thing about Barnwell was about being dumped on again. South Carolinians have gotten very uh, sensitive about the issue or about the notion that we are somehow the pay toilet of the South. 
not just for uh, municipal garbage, but for nuclear waste as well. And that's one of the things that allowed us to limit the amount of nuclear waste coming into Barnwell. A few years ago, the company that had bought it, the same company that owns the Clive, Utah, low-level nuclear waste site, tried to change the law in South Carolina to allow the Barnwell site to stay open to all the low-level waste in the whole United States because they knew they weren't going to be able to make any money if they didn't have these big companies coming in and, and bringing their waste and paying for it. Well, it started out, it looked like they were going to win. But we started this campaign about, we don't want you dumping your stuff on South Carolina. You know, we, we use some more graphic terms than that. Um, <laughs> and, and, but, and, and it was a long fight, but when the final day came that the legislative, the committee that was dealing with this had to vote on whether to allow this to go forward, they unanimously voted against it, even the guy that introduced the bill. So they have gotten very sensitive to the notion that we are becoming a dump state for all kinds of things, mainly nuclear waste and also for municipal garbage. So that has really helped a lot. And it really brings back the philosophy that people should take care of their own garbage. You make it, you keep it. I mean, we, tr we like to use the analogy, what if you went out in your backyard and threw your garbage over in your neighbor's yard? How would they like that? Well, it's the same thing. You know, if we make our garbage, we should keep it and we should deal with it. And what that would do is that would prompt us all to make less garbage. Unfortunately, that's not the way the garbage industry works in this country. And at some point, we'll all have to recognize that. But um, that's been the biggest thing that has helped us in our fight. It hasn't had anything to do with health effects. It's just this notion that we're being unfairly targeted as a dump state because we're small and we're poor and somehow we think the money is worth it, you know, and um, people have pretty much unanimously said no. Has this followed through with the politicians of the state and the media? With, I mean, with nuclear being such a large portion of the state's economy, are you finding that you have any leverage with elected officials or with those people in press, radio, and TV? Well, it's really strange that the same people who will vote for not allowing garbage to come in their state think that we should take our nuclear garbage and dump it in Nevada. <laughs> I found that rather hypocritical. <laughs> so they were all like clamoring that Yucca Mountain must open. It's like, well, you guys allowed all this nuclear waste to be made and now you just want to send it somewhere else, right? Well, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost here. We have 4,000 tons of nuclear waste sitting in our state at the, at the reactors with nowhere to go. So I think gradually it's becoming apparent that the whole issue of the waste is really a, an albatross around the neck of the industry, and there doesn't seem to be any, uh, any answer coming. And I think politicians are getting a little bit nervous about it, for sure. That and the cost of nuclear, of course, is definitely uh, hurting things. Do you see any kind of a resolution to the problems that you and, of course, all of us are facing when it comes to nuclear waste? I think that nuclear waste is an unsolvable problem. You can't make it unradioactive. Reprocessing doesn't really solve anything. You can't reprocess low-level waste. It's an unsolvable problem, and the only way to solve it is to stop making it. I think future generations are going to look back on us and go, what were they thinking? They're going to have to babysit this stuff for a millennia. We just watched a really amazing movie at my local Sierra Club group last week, Into Eternity. I think it's the name of it. It's the story of the Finnish. The Finns are building the, own, the world's only high-level repository. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It was first shown at the Sundance Film Festival. It's a story about the incredible painstaking project that they are undertaking to deal with their small amount of nuclear waste that they created. And here in this country, we have 70,000 tons of high-level waste, and who knows how much low-level waste that is being buried unsatisfactorily in places like Barnwell, and there's no place for it to be disposed of for the high-level waste. It's a problem that is unsolvable. It's going to be incredibly expensive. It's going to be very bad for the environment, and the only way to solve it is to just not make any more and to phase out nuclear power in all of its aspects as quickly as possible. From your mouth to somebody with the power's ears. <laughs> I hope so. Susan Corbett, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot I, I appreciate so much what you do and your show, and I follow you on Facebook, and I do appreciate all the work that you're doing. 
Well, thanks. And here's to us getting a lot more done and maybe turning these jerks around. Amen. Susan Corbett, chair of the National Sierra Club Nuclear Issues Activist Team. Okay, I'm making a commitment here. My book is now set for ebook release as of Thursday, February 27th, and I'm going to hold myself to that. It's called My Very Personal Nuclear Reaction, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. It's both a memoir and a nuclear cautionary tale. I'm going to be asking everyone to buy the ebook, if you can, on that one day, February 27th. It'll really help me in the Amazon rankings. And yes, as soon as I can figure out how to do it, I will get a free excerpt up at NuclearHotSeat.com. So now, for the Radiation Weather Report, here's Radcast. This is Mimi German for Radcast.org. Today is Tuesday, February 4th, 2014. We're going to talk about sick house syndrome today, a term we coined this morning. When we look at radiation, we look at elevation, and data from nearby locations to see if there are patterns in readings or on graphs. Sometimes we'll see a spot where the readings are elevated by radon. When we see plumes coming in from Japan, we see elevated readings in wide areas, not just in one spot. San Leandro, California, for instance, is back in the hot seat due to East Bay radon, we think, with readings at 40 counts per minute peaking at 76. Every few weeks, this site reads high, but we don't see it as a plume. There are locations that repeat similar patterns, while other areas nearby do not. Another one we see often is in Spearfish, South Dakota. The reader at this site tested her house for radon recently and found she is a bit higher in the count than we would like. So I asked my teacher today a question about radon in our readings. We see areas which are known to have high radon counts and higher elevation as well. How do we deal with the information in trying to come to terms with the question of our readings, whether they're from fallout or radon? His response was this. Mostly we take it with a pinch of salt. In other words, radon is nearly ever present in the atmosphere and accounts for a fair slice of the overall RADS pie, along with cosmic background. All one can do is factor it into the reading. So what my teacher is saying is that radon is very, very present in all of our readings. And what we do know at RADCAST is where the higher radon levels are. If we look at an area and we don't see higher readings, but we see higher readings on one site, we're pretty sure this is due to radon. Then there are the issues of nuclear leaks and fallout. Are the readings due to one or the other? Is it both? Is it radon? Is it the jet stream? Well, we don't really know. We can't discern that. What we do know is that radiation was here in the beginning. On top of cosmic and terrestrial radiation, we now have man-made radiation to deal with. And those levels we do know are getting higher day to day, week to week, year to year, with every nuke disaster, with every nuclear plant leak, and with the plumes in the sea and additions from Fukushima to the already radiated jet stream. And it's here to stay, folks. Radon or nuke leaks? What matters now are the numbers. Do you have a meter yet? The government won't be very helpful to you in this endeavor in understanding your environment, so do get a meter. Salisbury, Mass. 81 yesterday CPMs. Today is 76 CPMs with a high of 128. Hellertown, PA, 51 counts per minute, high of 76. Spearfish, South Dakota, 50 counts per minute with a high of 83. Colorado Springs is spiking upward at 64 counts per minute with a high of 104, while Durango, Colorado is seeing an average of 73 counts per minute with a high of 106. That's pretty high, folks, in Durango. Paso Robles, which we do see again, it shows up as a, a higher area in California, 41 average with a peak of 98, and Sitka, Alaska sitting pretty at 3161. You can read the full RADCAST report on RADCAST.org. This is Mimi German for RADCAST.org.
I'm proud to announce that I am the nuclear pundit for Jon Stewart and The Daily Show. He just doesn't necessarily know that yet. So if you can get word to Jon Stewart, I ask every week, and it's amazing some of the connections I've been getting. So send your information to info at nuclearhotseat.com and set John and me up. And just for coffee. I'm not looking for a relationship. Here's a radiation awareness and protection tip. Did you know that DNA evidence can now prove a link between cancers and Fukushima radiation? Scientists have been able to discriminate between the cancers caused by the radioactive contamination and those that arise naturally. Professor Horst Zitzelsberger of the Radiation Cytogenetics Unit of the Helmholtz Zentrums München in Germany ascribes the success of this study to the careful collection, documentation, and storage of thyroid cancers from the Chernobyl region in the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. Who knew that such a thing even existed? He noted that this unique collection of materials made it possible for the team to compare for the first time tumors from children of the same age and regional background. The causes of cancer and the links to radiation exposure has been an invisible link until now. So now the bastard citing no immediate danger won't be able to get away from the consequences of their actions any longer. Great news. For today's final thought, I want to recommend a book, The Warning by Mike Gray and Ira Rosen. This is the great, gripping, harrowing story of what happened at Three Mile Island, blow by blow, and is the definition of the dangers of human error in connection with all things nuclear. This is the story of how deeply and how terribly human misjudgment came into play in creating the worst nuclear accident to ever take place on American soil. I was afraid of the book for many years and only recently read it for the first time. I urge you to not wait that long and to read it before March 28th, which is the 35th anniversary of Three Mile Island. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 4, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, thank you, Grant, Global Security Newswire, nti.org, pittsburghpostgazette.com, Stars and Stripes, kpbs.com, Mendocino County Board of Supervisors, Bloomberg, City Channel 4, World Nuclear News, Illinois Entertainer, Asahi Shimbun, Martin Fackler and the New York Times, Japan Crush, XSKF, Xinhua, Wall Street Journal, Kyoto News, NHK itself, MIT Center for International Studies, TEPCO, blogger Iori Mochizuki and Fukushima Diary, Japan Daily Times, EcoWatch.com, BBC, Penza News, NBCNews.com, RT.com, STV.com in Scotland, and Formable.com and Lucas Hickson, one of our best investigative reporters, and Kumar Sindaram coming from India, a GreenRoadBlogspot.com, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Activist shout-outs with gratitude to Beverly Findlay Kaneko, who continues to be a great link to what's happening on the ground in Japan, and both gave me that story of, that was my numbnuts of the week and translated the poster, and Joni Ray for her help in getting this program posted to YouTube, which has the potential of saving me the bandwidth charges that are threatening to sync this show. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Our archive is available on iTunes or at NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog. All comments welcomed as long as you keep them civil. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2014, Lee B. Halevi and Heart History Communications, all rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You've got my permission to reuse all of this as long as you provide proper attribution. That's me by name and the website. This is Libby Halevi of Heart History Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? 
nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.